Okay, welcome everybody. Just gonna wait a few minutes or a minute or so here until everyone's able to log in. I see some familiar names of people coming in already. Some of you have been on our webinars for the last few weeks. And we're expecting a rather large crowd here today. So I'm just gonna wait to give everyone the opportunity. Welcome to the last webinar in our Friday series here today. And still people coming in. And while we're at it, I'm just gonna share my slideshow here. And I believe you can still see me and our guest, Don Keim. Okay, I think everyone that's gonna be in is in. And so welcome everyone. I'm Derek Auger, I'm the Executive Director of Conservatory Canada. And today I'm joined by our Director of Teacher Outreach, Don Keim, who comes to us today from Kelowna, BC. I'm in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Um, if you're there, feel free to throw in the chat box. We'd like to hear where you're calling from today or where you're coming in, where your home studio is, whereabouts in Canada or anywhere in the world for that matter. And as I go on today with this presentation, well, first of all, we're going to take a little poll to see uh, what you want to hear about and what you're here for today and what specifically would be of use for you as a new CT, new CC teacher or a newer CC teacher. That's how we marketed this. We wanted to do a session, Don and I, for all the teachers out there that are newer to CC, maybe you're curious about taking, having your students take one of our exams, or maybe you've already taken a couple of our exams and still have some questions. We realize that as we sort of modernize and work to provide something for students that's more relevant and maybe more modern, that we can be a bit convoluted at times and our exam syllabi can be a bit confusing. It may be hard to find where the materials are, the teaching materials, but we do have it all there. And that's what today is about, to help fill in those blanks and make you feel a little bit better about making that decision to have a student try one of our exams. And Dawn and I are gonna talk from our sort of first person experience as studio teachers as well about that process and how it goes. Okay, so who do we have here so far? Calgary, uh, Regina, Ottawa, a couple of you from Ottawa already. Moncton, New Brunswick, welcome. And I know there's a number of other of you. If you're just joining in, feel free to put it in the chat box where you're calling in from today. Everyone's gonna get a replay link later. This is being recorded, so you'll be able to watch this later as well. Serious questions, throw those in the Q&A and we'll stop periodically to do those. There's a Q&A box, the chat box is separate. You can feel free to throw questions in the chat. Don's gonna monitor the chat, I'm gonna monitor the Q&A and we'll stop periodically. So first of all, a poll, I'm just gonna launch this poll. If you can answer four questions for us, you'll see those questions on the screen. This will help sort of direct the flow today. So we'll just give everyone a couple of minutes to look those over and give us an idea about what you want to hear. We're prepared to cover pretty much anything today, which would take two to three hours. So I wouldn't mind narrowing that down a little bit so we don't waste anyone's time. Most of this is geared towards piano teaching today, but we're also prepared. We can talk a little bit about voice too. And question number four, I mentioned mock exams. That's something that we're seriously considering. I know everyone here on the poll so far wants to see a mock exam. In the new year, those are coming. And we will do them live, I believe. We're going to do them live in the webinar format here. We're going to get a couple organized so that you can see from the back end how these look like. Okay, so, so far it seems most of you have not submitted a student before. So we have a lot of new teachers here. And in terms of detail, it seems quite specific. You want to half of you want to learn more, or the same amount of you want to learn more about classical piano as contemporary reading. So we'll cover both of those. We'll give you an overview of the CC syllabi. I'll show you where you can get an even better overview of these syllabi on our website with other recorded webinars we have. Uh, a fair number of you want to hear about keyboard harmony and improvisation and hearing about choosing more repertoire. So that's good. And like I said, everyone wants to hear about a mock exam and see how that would work. So we'll be sure to cover this. There's a couple of you that want to hear more about voice. So I'll make mention of that. And if I forget, 
Uh, please throw that in the chat or the Q&A so that I remember to do that. Okay, so I think everyone here, and there's a few of you still probably filling this out. For those just joining, there's a poll on the screen. If you want to just quickly fill out those four questions, it'll give us an idea about how to direct our flow today. I've got a rather long slideshow. We will probably go just over an hour here today, maybe an hour, 15 minutes, depending on how many questions there are. And if you're just joining live, everyone's going to get a replay link after. Everyone will also get my slideshow notes in a PDF by email, probably later today, if not tomorrow at the latest. And we will stop for questions, throw your questions in the Q&A or in the chat box. I'm going to monitor the Q&A. Dawn's going to monitor the chat. Okay, so thanks for sharing your thoughts here on the poll. I'm just going to close the poll and we'll get started with my slideshow and webinar here. And Stacy, already in the Q&A, you're here to be more confident in my switch over from RCM. We've heard a lot about that, Stacy, from a lot of teachers. And I've talked to a lot of teachers individually over the past few months about that and years, in fact, but over the past year, we seem to have a lot more people contemplating that switch for one way or another. And we're under, starting to understand some of the friction of what might be behind that switch. It can be kind of scary for people, I think. And so, you know, maybe before I start, Don, I'm going to turn this over to you for a second as our Director of Teacher Outreach. Can you tell us what was it like when you first came on as a CC teacher? What, what, what experiment did you go through with your students in, in, in taking this on? Well, when I, by the way, hello, everybody. I'm from Kelowna. I recently moved from Alberta, so I see lots of uh, people here from Alberta. So. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you here. Um, when I first learned of Conservatory Canada, oh, that was years ago, and I was so excited. It was a program I was looking for for so many years, uh, classically trained, and I still love my classical music, um, but I had a lot of students that, you know, they, they liked the classical, but they also wanted the contemporary side. And so I was so excited. Um, I heard about it from um, uh, a teacher, Derek Stahl. He was out of Calgary at the time and Victoria um, um, Warwick at the time. And I was so excited, but like so many teachers, very, very nervous. I'm like, I don't know. I, all I know is my classical side, you know, it's my, my safe little box and it was, and it was wonderful. Um, but I was also very intrigued and very excited to learn, you know, all these different genres that my, my students wanted to learn. Um, that I liked playing myself. I liked the pop. I liked the rock. I liked, you know, learning, you know, ragtime and all that stuff. Um, so my experience when I first started over was I had this poor, willing, willing student that was doing her grade eight exam. So I'm like, let's just throw you in here. <laughs> so I threw threw her in knee deep. I'm like, let's do a grade eight exam. And it was a learning curve for both of us. Modes was something I only knew through my theory exams right um so it was very interesting so learning modes what do we do with these other than writing them out in a in my theory exam and so you know learning all of that was was a whole new step for me and for her and um the other thing that i did i'm like how are they going to ask these questions i knew nothing about these different exams, all I did was RCM exams. So I kind of knew growing up doing my own exams, how are they going to do these exams? So what I did is I threw myself, I took the exams. Um, so I went in because I wanted to know, you know, as a, as a new teacher, how are they going to ask my students these questions? So I did, I did a lot of the exams. I think I went up to level six or level seven of the contemporary side. And that's how I learned um, how are they going to ask these questions. Now we have, you know, myself and Derek, who, you know, you don't have to necessarily run through all the exams yourself, although it was a great learning experience for myself to do the exams. But now you can say, you know, how are they going to ask this question when my put my little Johnny in for this exam, right, we all become mother hens and we all want to look after our own students as, as I do myself, I want to make sure that there's nothing that's going to be thrown at them that I don't know about. So um, so that was my my uh, first thing that I did when I went over to the Conservatory Canada side. I threw a thousand questions at poor Kelly. She was wonderful, right? And she she got back. I'm like, how do I do this? How do I do that? And now we have um, and Derek, you've been wonderful with answering any questions that I have. And and now as um, you know, Director of Teacher Services, 
I get people asking me and I think it's wonderful. Don't go in and don't worry about not knowing. There was lots of times I thought I had silly questions. They weren't silly questions. You don't know until you ask, right? You don't know until you know. That was my my um, thing. And so people will ask me questions all the time. I'm like, keep the questions coming. So that was my first experience. Yeah, that's awesome. And so everyone there, you know, Don's been through this for a number of years now and, and sits in a rather unique position um, similar to where you are now. And so whenever you get into this, if you have a specific question, you can reach out to myself, you can reach out to Don. These are the, you know, we're the two best people, I think, to reach out to whether you have a question about classical piano or contemporary piano, she'll be able to answer for us. Uh, so thanks for that, Don. It's nice to hear, you know, where you started from. And, and it, it is a learning curve, isn't it? It is. Yeah. So I will start a little bit here. I've got this slideshow presentation for everyone. I'm going to gloss over some of this, but I'm going to show you later where you can recap it and where you can look at it maybe at a slightly slower pace. First of all, what teachers are saying about CC, there's been a lot of talk lately and we've had a lot of feedback. And so I'm just putting some things on the screen here that people are saying about the change. And, and these are people that have you know, tried us out recently over the last year and a half since the pandemic started. Um, you can see there what it is and, and how interesting some of the comments are. Here are some longer comments here. These ones came from online social media comments. And so you can read through these now. You can also read through them later when you get the replay or when you get the PDF of the show notes here. And then also parents too. We've had a number of parents reach out to us and, and thank us for the great experience for, for, for making the exam real for students. And that's really at the roots of what we're all about. Our examiners, I say, are the friendliest examiners on the planet. Dawn is one of our examiners as well. Um, whether it's the online format or when we can get back to in-person exams, which we are dedicated to doing hopefully next June, um, we, we provide an experience that puts the students first. The assessment is there. It is serious. It can be formal, but we don't try to make it feel like it's formal. It's just honoring the work and celebrating the work that the students have done and the learning and all of that we acknowledge and we honor their, their progress. And that's what comes first. What makes Conservatory Canada different? This question comes up quite often um, because people know there's a difference, but they don't really know what it is. So first of all, a classical and contemporary stream, they're both accredited. They both have the same credits in different high school credits that you can get accreditation for in the various provinces across Canada. And so those are kind of same, the skills between contemporary and classical are a lot more similar now. We've done some revisions to both syllabi lately, and we'll show you what those look like. Flexible exam scheduling year round for online and theory exams. We started online examining in 2007, and I'll talk a little bit more and show you what that looks like later using our MIDI platform. And now that we're familiar with Zoom, and at some point we may actually switch over to another platform to do online exams, um, that will always be there for those that want that flexibility. And as we always have since 2007, you can schedule these exams at any time of the year, whenever the student is ready, or they can fit into a larger seasonal session, more traditional session that we still, that we still offer in February and in June. Theory exams are also scheduled only on a flex basis now. 100% of our theory exams are scheduled at any time of the year. There are no set times to do theory anymore. Uh, E-exams I've talked about a little bit, and I'll show you what that technology looks like. Many lessons with examiners. This is something where we, we've had this for a very long time, but when students register for their exam, they can pay an extra fee. Right now, the fee is $39 for a 15-minute session with the examiner immediately after the exam. And this is where you can work together. The parents can come into the room. The teacher can come into the room. They can ask questions of the examiner. The examiner can simply teach. But it's a student-led process that honors the work, gets the assessment out of the way, and the examiner can work with and break down some of these traditional barriers that might exist and just add a bit of value to the overall experience. A flexible repertoire with the own choice piece on every exam features an own choice piece and three approvals. And in fact, when you get into the syllabi, you'll notice that really the entire exam can be own choice if you start to read the parameters and understand how that works. There are a lot of teachers that work with the students and the whole exam ends up being own choice. Improvisation and keyboard harmony skills we'll talk about, that's unique to us. Background questions, we used to call this viva voce, but all of our exams, we call it background questions. Students are expected to know about the composer, what key the piece is in, 
be able to explain the meaning of the title, the signs and symbols on the page, and give oral answers to the questions that the examiner might ask. They're not there to trick students, but to get them to express out loud, to deepen their understanding of what they are actually doing and what, what they are playing. Partial exams from grade level seven and up. Um, okay, a couple of questions already, I'll just stop for here. Uh, do you need a digital piano to do an e-exam? No, you don't. You can, so what we basically do is we divide this into two camps. Those that have a digital piano and want to use software, which I'll explain in a minute, can do a MIDI exam, we call it, or a, a MIDI e-exam. And that's connecting to digital pianos remotely so the examiner hears exactly what the student's playing in real time. Or if the student has an acoustic piano or are using an acoustic piano somewhere, we can use Zoom currently. That's the platform we use to do an acoustic exam. So they don't need a digital piano. But if you want to use the MIDI software, you need a digital piano. So that's a good question. And we've had some webinars on that. Um, and I can direct you to some of those later. But I'll go over what those exams entail. And is there a piano grade range that students must be in to receive credits through school? It's different in every province, but it's identical to what RCM offers. So if you're familiar with RCM and how their credits work through high schools, through the provinces, it's identical for Conservatory Canada. We have the exact same arrangements. Um, Dawn, can you think of anything else that makes us different from other institutions? Um, well, there, the one thing, the big thing um, with the contemporary side, and I'm a big advocate for, is, um, and it's a great thing to be able to do as a student, is to... Um, to play and sing. So if one of you are in the contemporary exams, if you want to um, do three songs, just play in a different genres. And then if your student likes to sing and they can learn to, uh, you can teach them to play and sing and that can be used for an exam song. And the nice thing, it, it doesn't matter if they, they're not the best singer, they're only marked on their playing, how they accompany themselves um, while they're while they're singing and playing. So I think that is a fabulous um, thing that Conservatory Canada offers. And I know from my own students, because all of a sudden you put a mic in front of one of them and you know the, the little Johnny gets to play a song that he really enjoys, they love it. And it's it's just something else that um, is a big takeaway, right? And it definitely um, steps up the game as far as not everything is just plain, they learn how to accompany if they're going to church, right? So it's just another thing that we can help them grow as a musician. So I love that about Conservatory Canada, that we're able to have them be able to do this for one of their exam choices. Right. Yeah, we like to say we produce well-rounded musicians. We spend time on these other skills. We want to hear them. Um, but at the same time, there are other ways to do things a different way if there isn't time for those students. We'll talk about more of those later. But yeah, that's a great one. And I've examined some of your students in the past yeah. that have done play and sing. And just yeah. to see them light up and be able to share that within the assessment setting, it just looked huge for them. The yes, they love it. They love it. We also have some familiar things. What is familiar about CC to other institutions you might be using at the moment with your students? History and tradition. Our roots trace back to 1891, which is nearly as old as RCM. Uh, back to the London Conservatory of Music, later became the Western Ontario Conservatory of Music in 1934 in London. It had more of an Eastern Canada reach. And then in 1997, we merged with the Western Board, which had a reach from Manitoba West to the West Coast to become the truly national conservatory of Conservatory Canada. All exams are accredited for high school credits across Canada in all provinces. Uh, theory co-requisites from grade level five, which rudiments, harmony, and history. It's very similar to other institutions. Our associate diploma is called the ACCM, the Associate of Conservatory Canada in Music, and we offer that as a performer's exam and a teacher's exam. And those are set up similar to what you may be familiar with, but as a teacher's exam, our pedagogy is a separate exercise. It's not in three levels, it's only one exam. And it's actually a research component where students prepare a uh, given 24 questions in a two volume textbook. They're given a, a whole research component. They spend a year compiling answers, written answers to, and we have a little interview process. And that's the pedagogy certificate that's part of the teacher's exam. Um, leveling of repertoire is reflected in the traditional Canadian standard that you're familiar with. So we do follow what's in the RCM or the CNCM syllabus. Repertoire publications and teacher support materials for skills. We don't have fancy skills books necessarily, but I'll show you what some of these books look like so that you understand where to start finding some of the, the teaching resources. Okay, so Cheryl says she's intrigued by the play and sing option and you teach both, uh, both, both piano and voice. How do we advise contact people and resources for voice teachers? 
Yeah, that's a good question, Cheryl. Thanks for bringing that forward. Um, in terms of voice and to find resources, that's something we're working a little bit more on right now so that we could have someone, but just reach out to either me or our office and you'll see the contact information at the end of the slideshow and we can answer any of your questions about voice and forward you on this to one of our specialists, one of our examiners in voice if you have more specific questions about how some of these things work. Um, and how does CC offer more for your music? That's one of our taglines. We have friendly examiners focused on honoring student success. Recital assessments. In addition to our traditional certificate exam stream where we do repertoire and skills, a recital assessment is where a student prepares a body of repertoire to play in a live recital with family and friends present. And maybe there are other students doing the same thing from the teacher studio. The examiner's at the back of the hall taking notes giving an adjudication. Sometimes the examiner will get up and even do like a festival style adjudication after it with all the students. And then you get a gold, silver or bronze standing and the students prepare program notes. There's no skills involved with a recital assessment, but it still honors the fact that students want to perform live among their peers. We award over $30,000 in scholarships annually from an endowment fund that's worth well more than a million dollars that's managed by the Leonard Community Foundation. So this is something that's well, maybe not unique, but unique to us in that we realize that you know, we have a lot of money to disperse every year. We have a, an annual master class where we invite top students from across Canada to come and work with a clinician for the weekend as part of our convocation weekend. And like I said, $30,000 in scholarship is something that definitely makes us different. And, and students, we award medals of excellence for highest marks per province per each grade level per instrument. Um, we're very approachable, just a phone call or email away with quick replies. Right now, the best way to get a hold of us is by email. We do answer the, we don't answer the phone live because we're not working from the office during the pandemic, um, but you can leave a voicemail if you want. We have a 1-800 number, which we'll show you later. Um, as technological innovators, we invented our e-exam platform in 2007. So when the pandemic hit, it was a pretty easy pivot for us to get online. And we did so right away and quite clearly people have commended us on that. And we have more time with the examiner per exam at a fair price. And so by more time, I mean a grade one exam is the full 20 minutes long. By grade eight, it's 40 minutes long. We hear all repeats. Um, we don't cut students off. Uh, sorry, we hear all repeats up to grade six for borough piece. So I shouldn't say we hear all repeats. Um, we hear all pieces in their entire length is what I'm trying to get at there. And just generally, we put teachers and students first. How do you become a CC teacher? This is something we get a lot of lately. There's no certification process that's formal. You register in your online teacher portal to become a CC teacher. It doesn't need to get approved or anything. You just are a CC teacher regardless of your qualification. We're here to help you wherever you're at, whatever your background is, however educated you are as a teacher or as a musician. We realize that you're helping students and we're here to help you as well. You can research our requirements online for syllabus and I'll show you what that looks like on the website where we also have recorded webinars and I'll show you where those are uh, and just ask questions. I think that's the best thing to do right now is don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, we realize that it's convoluted. We offer a lot of flexibility and with that, our verbiage in our syllabus has to be kind of dense sometimes and it's hard to figure out what we're after. If you like things simple, you can still use our syllabi in a simple way. It just may not seem like it when you see so many options, uh, but we're here to help and just ask and we can make it clearer for you. And then really to become a CC teacher, just submit students for exams and attend mini lessons. Get your students to sign up for mini lessons and you'll learn as you go. Um, and really there's not a lot to learn. Yeah, the, the feel's a little different. It's maybe a little less formal sometimes. It's more friendly than people might be used to. But just we encourage you to dive in. You're not going to do anything wrong. And, and we see teachers make mistakes occasionally. And when you let us know, there are ways we can cover that up for you so that, you know, the student or the family still knows that you know what you're doing. Sometimes we there's a fear around that. Don, do you have any experience with that? Um, like with, I'm sorry, can you say that again? Like, yeah, like with, say sometimes a requirement wasn't quite met or the teacher misinterpreted the requirement or the teacher used the old syllabus requirements in the back of the old books, things like that happen. Yes, and I've had that happen on a couple exams. And so first and foremost, it's all about the student in that moment, right? They're there and we're there to make it a, the, the best experience 
for them. So we just roll with it. If if you learned this and it was not necessarily on this, but you learned a different, you know, we're going to roll with it. We might mention to the teacher afterwards, you know, it's an honest mistake, right? You know, they maybe had an old syllabus or whatever, but we will never let the student know that at the time. We'll just, okay, you're going to go with this and we'll just make it the best experience for them. And we just, yeah, the, the main thing we are is we want to be I always say this, we're there, this is about you that day, I want to be the examiner that I want to have, right, so we're there and it's 100% positive, and we are very, very flexible, we're never going to say, oh, you should have done this, that will not happen. Yeah, absolutely, and, and it'll be a fair assessment, students will still get marks for things, so don't worry about making mistakes, we're here to cover you and we want you to learn the process and, and, and what's involved. So over to our website for a second. I'm just going to get into the presentation and take you over to the website if I can. One second. So I was afraid of you're not something not working on the computer. <laughs> okay, one moment. Oh, there we go. Okay, website. Here's what our website looks like live. You can see here. This is our homepage. We have some new graphics on here now that we just did in the last couple of months, which are really great. But we've tried to make the menu process really straightforward. On the homepage, you can see our latest news in the middle. And really one of the more interesting things in terms of our latest news is this piano music by women and BIPOC composers. I would highly encourage you to check out that little article. It's just a gold mine of information and Donna's helped us compile over 250 titles of music by women and BIPOC composers that have been added to our classical piano syllabus lists. Um, so I'd encourage you to check that out. But if you really want the syllabi, there is a syllabi tab here, but at the top there's learning tab. If you're interested in classical piano, you go to classical piano. And on this page is everything you need to know about classical piano. My computer's a little bit slow at the website. Actually, that wasn't bad today, but I'm sure you'll have a quicker experience than I do. Here are all the syllabi downloads on this page for classical piano. We'll talk about recital assessments. There's bios of women and BIPOC composers at the bottom. And so these are the syllabus files you can download to see what all the syllabi looks like. Down here though, tutorial videos on the left side, there's a, what is that, a 42 minute webinar on just the classical piano syllabus that I created a couple of years ago that's still very relevant. I, I would highly recommend checking that out. It's gonna be a little bit more detailed than we'll go through today. And then we have Keyboard Harmony, which is our main sort of extra skill for classical piano. I have three video tutorials here at various levels that really break down in detail exactly what you need to know about how to teach it and what it looks like. So if you have any questions about Keyboard Harmony or classical piano, you come to this page and there are four tutorials here that will occupy your time and you'll know pretty much everything you need to know. Um, contemporary piano, same thing. It's quite well supported. I'm just calling up that web page here so you can see what it looks like. Again, there's a, a video tutorial that's a bit longer in this case that goes through all of the skills in detail and what to expect, all the syllabi downloads in here. All of our current syllabi are only available online. We don't have hard copies of syllabus anymore. Um, you'll still see some old copies of syllabi, I'm sure, in different retailers. Don't buy them. And certainly in our, our, our publications, which I'll show you in a moment, we used to publish the requirements in the back of all of the books. It's going to take us a couple of years at least still to eliminate those requirements in the supply chain. So if your students have repertoire books or you have them, you're going to see syllabus requirements in the back of those books. We have to ignore those requirements. They're old and we're working hard to get that message out there. Here's the tutorial video here for improvisation. I've got two longer tutorials there about how to teach improvisation requirements. That's a whole unit unto itself and then an hour long uh webinar here at the bottom that's recorded on zoom that you can watch with a transcript and then below that you can get tracks for improvisation for the american popular piano improvisation content and we'll talk a little bit about what that means later contemporary dance there's a lot to know it's very rewarding for students uh, and it does take time but it's a great way to learn about improvisation and contemporary styles alongside students John, maybe can you speak a little bit again? What was it like getting into that for the first couple of years? Which was you had the first couple of students go into it. What did you learn and take on as a classical pianist when you started diving into this? Well, yeah. So again, it was very, very different. And it, you know, I'm not gonna lie, at first it's a little overwhelming, right? It, it's just different than anything we're used to, right? Um, and I really appreciate um the the A2 books that we use now. 
and the Christopher Norton having the little, you know, as a classical person that's not big on improvisation, right? What do I use? I'm not sure what, do, how do I go about doing this? And, and having the little, the little box and say, use these notes. This is why these notes work over this piece. And just having that extra um, little bit of support there um, saying and saying why those work. And then there you're like, okay, I never thought about this. And then with our use of learning how to play our minor and major pentatonics, you know, learned about those, did not know how to use them. And then with the contemporary side saying, well, this is actually how you use them to improvise with. This is how you use your blues skill to improvise. So having all those little things and learning, like these are just not random skills that you just have to learn for a technique, but how to apply them. So th that was a huge learning thing for me, but it was, it was just like a light bulb went on. It was like, okay, you know, it, it's great to learn them and learn the technique, but the application is, was the biggest thing for me. Right, right. Okay, that makes sense. Makes sense. In terms of our publications, then we are, you know, very part of the familiar aspect, perhaps, is the way that our theory is laid out. It's laid out in levels that start at grade five practical, so that for students to get a grade, uh, a grade five or a level five practical certificate, there's a theory prerequisite that goes with it, and those theory are very similar to RCM. There's a page on our website that has a chart for CC and RCM equivalents for theory so that you can understand where we're kind of at with it. Um, and then just to reiterate too, or to say for the first time to this audience, classical stream exams are by grade. And all we did for contemporary stream exams is call them levels instead of grades. So it helps differentiate a little bit. Most of that is just differentiating in the database. Um, so I'm gonna show, hold up some of these resources so you can see what we have for theory. We have two resources now. We have our original theory workbook list for students, levels one, two, three, and four. Levels one, two, and three are rudiments. Level four is preliminary harmony, an old course that used to kind of be optional, but for us it's mandatory and it's a prerequisite with grade eight practical. This is what our original theory books look like. They're a little bit thicker. They're a little bit older, maybe a little bit dated, but now we've got, we also recommend total theory by Deborah Wanless, a very good resource. I think if you're just starting fresh, you're gonna enjoy this resource a little bit more than our original publication. It's a little bit leaner. The explanations are a little bit clearer. And it also has theory one, two, three, four that it goes with. And in addition to the total theory, because this was written you know, slightly differently and there's some holes with our syllabus, Deborah's published these supplements which are available on the theory page of our website that teachers can download for free. Some of them are a hundred pages long with different exercises, charts that show you exactly what pages go with what parts of the requirements from the syllabus. So between this and the supplement that you download from our website for free, you'll be totally ready for any of the theory levels from theory one to four. For theory five, we never had a record. We had recommended texts, but now we have a really good dedicated text. Deborah Wannis has just authored this introduction to basic harmony. This goes with our theory five. It's co-requisite with grade nine and level nine uh, practical instruments. And this is, you know, your first year theory harmony level, rather. And this is a great textbook here that she's got available from Wanless Music. Um, repertoire, our new millennium series, which is well over 20 years old now, and we keep publishing it. This is what the repertoire looks like for piano, the repertoire books, the voice albums, go up, or the repertoire for piano goes up to grade 10, grades one to 10. The voice books go up from grade one to eight. Eight is quite thick. There's a lot of music in this repertoire. For example, grade five, I should say, the one I held up there. How many pages is that? 80 pages almost of, of repertoire. And we have for contemporary, oh no, I should say for skills. Andrew Hardridge publishes the best technique book ever, levels one to six. So if you're looking for a place where scales, chords, arpeggios are written out, sight reading examples, ear training examples, this is a great book to have. And there's a dedicated book for levels one to six. This is what he does. He writes them out on staff notation. He gives you a graphic on the keyboard for what that looks like with the fingering. So students have really great ways. He's done something neat with the triads too. Let's see if I can find that. Arpeggios are also laid out on the keys. Ah, that was interesting when he writes out triads. He's also given this interesting graphic here for some students might like to see that. So anyway, this is a great book. Again, also includes a little bit of sight reading and ear training. 
and a little piece on keyboard skills, which is really helpful. And then the other thing that goes with that are the keyboard skills books, which are for harmonization. I'm just going to grab one here. This series, books one, two, three, four by Deborah Wan, let's go with our grades four to associate level for the keyboard harmony component. And those you'll find at wanless.com as well for Deborah Wanless Music, sorry. Um, so that's a lot there. Now on the contemporary side, our main sort of album for repertoire is the Canadian Contemporary Repertoire Series. We have levels one to five in this. And then how Leonard years ago publishes and still publishes these albums here, which also go from level one to five, which are more pop stylings that feed into the contemporary repertoire. Contemporary repertoire you can also use in the classical exam. There's a lot of mixing and matching that can go on. You have students that you know enjoy a bit of classical, a little bit of contemporary. They can do a classical exam and have a lot of contemporary repertoire on it. They can also do a contemporary exam and have up to one classical piece on that exam. So there's lots of ways you can mix and match. And then these books here for the contemporary idiom stream are essential. This is our improvisation manual, the American Property Piano Etude Series, which goes from levels one to eight. And so as you get into the syllabus and you've got all these things, those are what the books look like. You'll find these in different places, long in the plate stocks, everything. Some of these you're going to find at Deborah Wanless Music. And, uh, but I, I would recommend starting at Long and McQuaid. If you go there and search for Conservatory Canada, they have three dedicated pages that show all these publications in one place. That's the best place to see them. Okay. I imagine that's going to spawn some questions. Um, oh, Dennis is asking, do you use rubrics for voice exams? For example, if a piece is valued at nine, are individual marks awarded for pitch, rhythm, diction, interpretation, so that everyone knows how the grade was awarded. We don't use rubrics like that, no. We have a critical listening protocol that we follow. Um, and it's easier for me to explain for piano, but I'll explain it broadly so we understand how we're thinking with all of our instruments. We don't box examiners into this little way of thinking like, like figure skating marks or something in a way, or using rubrics, but we listen for, first of all, quality of sound, How's the notation and rhythm? How are the articulation and dynamics? How are the phrasing? How's the structure? How's the overall performance? We sort of work through those layers. And if we hear each layer in place, we move to the next layer. If we don't hear that layer in place, we stop there and cap the assessment at 60, 70, 80, 90%, whatever it's gonna be. So we kind of work on that kind of model. And at some point I did mention, we've had a webinar like this a couple of years ago and I'm gonna get that out again and do that one again at some point. But to answer your question, Dennis, no rubric, no solid rubric like that, but layers of listening that we use. Derek, I see that uh, Cheryl has a question. It says, do you have advice for selecting teacher's choice? Oh, okay. So we don't call it teacher's choice. We call it own choice. Um, and there's no guide. I mean, it's whatever a student's interested in. And it can be at the same level or any one piece on any of our exam can be any grade level higher. It just can't be at any grade level lower. You don't need to get special approval. Um, sometimes teachers throw it to us because they're not sure. We can answer those questions for you too. But in terms of guidelines, really anything goes. We have a lot of students, we'll talk about this when it comes to contemporary repertoire. There are a lot of pop stylings out there that students love to play. They download them from musicnotes.com. The arrangement is they, they, they put it together, but it's not exactly what's written on the page. We encourage that. We encourage editing to eliminate unnecessary repeats to keep the length of the piece down a little bit. Um, we also encourage editing of the left hand, especially the left hand rhythms are often quite unrealistic, but students can really edit those scores to make them playable as long as the final result they're playing is around their grade level. That's what a lot of students end up doing. It could be a piece from anywhere. There's absolutely no guideline. It could be play and sing. Dawn, can you think of anything else people can use for own choice? Um, well, you know, lead sheets. So for the play and sing, you know, I'll have, um, uh, my students, they'll just submit a, a lead sheet or sometimes Kelly will send me, you know, can, what do you think of this lead sheet? And as long as they make it level appropriate. So again, if they're doing a, um, a level three song, you know, do we want to hear just like solid chords? Maybe the left hand could be a little bit more, you know, uh, a ballad bass or something like that. So as long as they, they make it level appropriate, they can submit lead sheets. So, you know, um, for example, a lot of my students, I'll just, I'll get it off of just a chord sheet and it'll have all the chords above as long as they can play at level appropriate. So they can use things like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Some students go on YouTube and learn it, learn it, you know, almost by rote using a tutorial, whether it's a Synthesia software or watching someone play and there's no score available. 
that's a great idea for own choice. Anything like that goes. And awesome. we even have some students do those kind of pieces, uh, not even as own choice, but as, as an actual repertoire choice, because you'll learn in a bit here, we'll talk about the free approval process. If you have a piece of music that is beyond own choice or you want to use as a repertoire choice, it, you don't even have to use it as own choice. You can use it as an actual repertoire choice that's not on our current syllabus by sending us a copy of the score to the office and we'll have it approved for you for free. If there's no score available, just tell us what you're going to do. Send us the lead sheet as Don suggested or say, you know, we have a performance from YouTube of this particular piece and I think it's at the grade level. Send the student in with it. Again, you can't do anything wrong on one of our exams. The student's going to get rewarded for doing the work that's honestly done. Um, the question I see in the, uh, could I repeat the grade tier? Sabrina, I think you're referring to uh, the what I call the critical listening protocol, the, the layers of listening that we do. Is Maybe that's what you're, I'll, I'll go over that again. And if that's not what you're after, just type back in and let me know. But basically, we listen to first the quality of sound. So in terms of a singer, what's the quality of that instrument? On a piano, what's the quality of the sound? Is it harsh? Is it too mellow? That's the first thing that kind of gets assessed or thrown into the mix. It's always there in the background through all the listening layers. Notation and rhythm are equally important in my mind. If the student's hitting too many wrong notes, that's going to affect the performance. If the rhythm doesn't have integrity, that's going to, fix the, that's going to affect the performance. And if there are serious enough rhythm and notation problems, that's where the examiner's ear stops and that's where the comments are directed because if those get fixed, the student's gonna succeed. If we start commenting and listening for dynamics and other things when those base layers are not present and working, then we're doing the student disservice. They need to stop and fix step one and that's what the assessment reflects and it's impossible to get over 79% if those things aren't in check. To achieve 80% on a piece of music, the student needs to have the rhythm and notation largely figured out and fluent. And then the examiner's ear can proceed to articulation, dynamics, then phrasing, perhaps. And then we get into overall interpretation and style performance practice, perhaps. And then, you know, for a student that is getting in the 90s, the quality of their communication. Are they having gesture in their sound through their articulation, the dynamics, the structure of the music? Is it holding together? Can we hear an obvious beginning, middle, end with appropriate use of transitions between those big sections? And then again, as a final check, what's the quality of the sound comes back into play again. Those are for those students, you know, scoring really high. That's how that sort of listening layers work. It's a general description of it. Don, can you think of anything else that we've talked about in the past as examiners that, that filters into that equation? Um, yeah, so I think you've touched on most, most everything. And I think presentation and um, you know, like dynamics, huge, big thing on that. Like how is the whole piece being, you know, overall, performed right but I think you've touched on most everything that we are listening for as far as the piece goes right um one other thing that Cheryl wanted is she says she is requesting a webinar demonstrating examples or examples of level appropriate playing off a lead sheet yes that would be great wouldn't it we've never really it's in the tutorials a little bit but we never really talk about it in detail that's a great idea and if anyone has any questions, and I think you've you've um, put my email at the bottom of this, if anybody would like any examples of, for example, how I would approach, you know, a, a lead sheet, absolutely would be more than happy. So a lot of our teacher resources are in our eSharp club, we call it. It's soon to be called teacher resources when we switch over to a new database. It's a $20 annual fee and you get access to everything for piano. We're gonna work on voice as well. We're getting some voice materials up there, but everything for sight reading, ear training technique is all written out there. There are sample theory papers from past years. We get those uploaded as well. And you can use those with your students and you can download whatever you want. So all of that stuff is, is very well supported there. I've shown you the Andrew Harbridge books. He's got a whole set for classical piano levels one to six and a whole set for contemporary piano levels one to six. The keyboard harmony I've shown you and the etudes book I've shown you what that looks like as well. That's for the uh, contemporary readings piano. In terms of e-exams, maybe I'll talk about this a little bit because a lot of you probably aren't aware quite how this works. And I think I've got my piano connected here. Just give me one second. I'm going to launch the internet MIDI software and show you what this looks like. Basically, it's a piece of software developed by Time Warp Technologies that we've been using for the last 14 years to connect two digital pianos remotely so that they're sharing sounds. It's quite an easy setup right now. It only costs $40 US to get this. 
And I'm just hooking up my digital piano here next to me to the software so that whatever I play shows up on the screen directly. Can John, can we see my internet MIDI screen right now on the screen? Yeah. Okay. yeah. The examiner can see what the student's playing. They can see how they're using the pedal. They can see how loud or soft. Velocity indicators at the top of the key. This is used as a double check and it's neat to use in remote lessons. I use this a lot during remote lessons to connect students. But really the interesting thing with this software is whatever a student plays, I can hear their sound coming through the speakers on my keyboard and vice versa. We've done the exams from Saudi Arabia. We've done them from the US all across Canada. All it is, all it needs is a somewhat stable internet connection. I've had students in remote areas where their internet's not very good on Zoom and we get the software going so they have a digital piano and it seems to stabilize everything. So it's a really great tool. Um, that's how e-exams work. If students want to use this, if they're comfortable using digital pianos, they can come into your studio and use your digital piano. They can use it from home if they're used to the software. It doesn't take much to set this up. Those are the digital MIDI exams that we use using digital pianos. The acoustic exams we use over Zoom currently, and we're currently looking at a couple of other apps that work even better, I think, for sharing sounds uh, analog over the internet. But that's, this is just an example of the e-exams. When we say e-exams or MIDI exams, this is the software that we use. And um, we can also provide that for you if you want to set up your studio to do the exams, where your students come into your studio to do the exam. We can help you set that up by even providing you the software for free. So know that that's an option as well. Can I just add to that a little bit, Derek? Sure. Um, before the pandemic was here um, and we had in-person exams and we had um, e-exams, um, a lot of my first time students would, I would opt to have them do just an e-exam. You know, there's something about having an examiner's head only this big, right? That's less intimidating to them as a student. And I used to always joke, I said, if we don't like how they look, we'll just move the computer away. So it just makes it less intimidating. Not that, that we are intimidating, intimidating examiners at all, but sometimes there's a little comfort where you know where all of a sudden there's not this big person in front of them so you know especially for first or nervous students it's a great way to kind of get them break them into into doing exams gently and then they're like oh well that was nothing right and then they're they're comfortable with going either way so that's just a te teacher's per you know perspective yeah there's a, there's a lot fewer nerves aren't there yes and you're playing on a familiar instrument most of the time you don't have to wait in line you don't have to drive anywhere during the pandemic, we do most exams from students' homes, and, and we'll tell you, after the pandemic's over, we're going to return to in-person exams, but we're also not going to abandon the idea of hearing an exam from a student's home. Before the pandemic, one quarter of all of our exams were heard using the digital MIDI software, and I think after the pandemic, we anticipate that at least half of students will just be still hearing exams from their home, the studio, the, the teacher studio. Um, Two examining streams, then we talked about classical, which is a blend of traditional classical with contemporary repertoire, if you want, and familiar skills. It's very much like an ABC studies exam. You can use it like that, but there's a lot more flexibility in there that we offer now in terms of how to structure it. And then the contemporary idioms is contemporary repertoire with improvisation skills on top of sight reading and ear, which are based on the classical models. And CI students can also choose contemporary repertoire with classical skills, they're more familiar. You don't have to do the improv if you don't want to. And so that's a mix and match option that we started offering a few years ago and teachers love it. They may be a bit intimidated by the contemporary skills. Um, they take a little bit longer to learn sometimes, especially the improv. And so that's a popular option as well. Um, here's what classical piano looks like in terms of mark distribution. Now I'll just talk about, I'm gonna be a little bit briefer now from this point on in the presentation, but Anything I say now is available on those webinars that I showed you that are recorded on the classical piano page and the contemporary idioms piano page. So group one for repertoire, this is how repertoire is sort of divided up. Group one is all classical and Baroque music in grade one, all the way up to grade five. And then group two repertoire is everything from romant romantic on through modern. And so a student just needs to have at least one classical Baroque piece and at least one modern or romantic piece and then really the other two are up to them. They can choose one group one or two and then a known choice piece. So it's possible on an exam like this to have a student do a Baroque piece, a classical piece and a modern piece and a study. If you're one that likes ABC studies, you can still do it that way. 
if the student likes contemporary music, you can have three contemporary pieces, anything by Christopher Norton, any of our Canadian composers, as long as you have one classical or Baroque piece, you're fine on the classical exam. So it can still be rather contemporary heavy. Memorizations there, we honor that memory mark. Techniques were 16. Sight reading is clap back a rhythmic pattern. Or sorry, clap a rhythmic pattern that's notated on computer train. And then also a very simple piano passage to read right hand and left hand. And then oral tests, always three things to do. Clap back, triads, identify triads as major or minor. And then chord tones. Chord tones is maybe the one thing that's a little different for most of you. We hear do, mi, so, do. And the examiner provides one of those notes. The student identifies it as one, three, five, eight, or do, mi, so, upper, do. That's what the ear training looks like. Background information, always worth, you know, a considerable amount of marks. If the student knows who their composer is in the higher grades, if they can give us details about who the composer is, if they know the key of the music, if they understand the signs and time signature, key signature, and what that all means, and they can express that orally, it's an easy eight marks. And just based on that alone, if they have that and their pieces memorized, they're going to score in the 80s more than likely. It's pretty hard not to when you've got those marks there. There are maybe a few more marks that we give on the page than other conservatories. And so it's a really fair distribution. And the marks tend to be, some people say that our marks are a little more inflated than other conservatories. I don't think our marking standards any different. It's just that there are more evaluation pieces and a couple of them are nice, fair, easy marks to obtain. Um, Dawn, you see any questions there at all? Uh, yeah, so Cheryl says fixed or move, movable dough. Right, uh, movable dough. Do is always one, depending on what key we're in. So yeah, nothing's fixed. By the time we get to grade five, two group one pieces, two group two pieces, own choice. So again, even here, if a student liked contemporary music, they could still do three out of five of their pieces are contemporary. As long as they have two from classical or Baroque, they can both be Baroque, they can both be classical. If you have a student that's got that aptitude to get to grade six, that's where all of a sudden they have to have a Baroque piece. So when you have students like that, we encourage teachers to you know, make sure students are learning one or two Baroque pieces from grades one to five, so that all of a sudden the style isn't gonna throw them off in grade six. So a lot of flexibility there, but still you know, a lot of us like to use that in its way. You can see how keyboard skills fits in here, progression and harmonization. We'll talk about in a moment what those are, but I think you'll find sight reading and ear tests very similar to, to other tests that you are used to. And the technique as well is rather fair. Grade eight, you have to know a, a, a group one is Baroque, group two is classical, group three is romantic, group four is modern. That's a more sort of set distribution by the time we get to grade eight. And again, these don't have to be from our lists. Our lists are absolutely vast. For the classical piano, you can use anything on the classical piano list. For the modern group four, you can use anything on the contemporary repertoire list that we have for the contemporary idioms exams. Uh, there are a number of other resources we have now. But if there's something not on the list, just scan and send it to the office and we'll give you free approval if we find that it's at the right level for what you're requesting. And let's see another question here. Oh yeah, studies are etudes. You'll see studies still in our old repertoire books. We haven't had a chance to change that all out. It's quite costly for us to edit those books in that way. We took all of the old studies and etudes and stuck them into the group one or group two or group three, group four on the various repertoire lists. So the studies are all still there. You can still use them. We just don't call them studies anymore. We call them group one, group two, group three, group four by grade eight, depending on the genre. Ron, do you have anything to add? Am I missing anything there on how that uh, repertoire goes? No, I don't think so. I think you've covered everything there. Okay. Again, grade eight's a full 40 minutes. It's a nice long exam. There's no rush on these exams with students in the exam room. I've talked about most of this here. And again, uh, you have to ignore the old requirements in the back of the old books. That's one thing we have to remember. And it's easy not to know that. So I'm glad you're all on this rep are on this webinar. Just please spread that word. Um, I think I've spoken about everything there. Music by women and BIPOC composers. This is something kind of newer for us where we've added, I mean, it's amazing. We have four sort of resident experts that are examiners here at Conservatory Canada that are doing work. Uh, with international bodies and doing work online, scouring and looking during the pandemic, there's a whole group of musicologists there that are finding and unearthing music that was long forgotten or suppressed over the ages. And they're working to get it into standard notation and throw it up online. One of our 
actually a couple of our examiners, one Eleanor Gummer, who is the owner of One Eye Publications, who does Piano Kids Beginner Method. She has started publishing and now has three volumes of women composers music in print. I don't have that book right here within my grasp, but if you go to One Eye Publications, you'll find that. Really exciting stuff. Deborah Wanless is also publishing a bunch of stuff. Olivia Adams has a brand new syllabus and anything in her syllabus called Loud and Clear. And actually, that I can grab a copy of. It's available at Wanless Music. It looks like this. Anything in this book is also good on any of our exams. And this is all leveled and graded. And that's published by Wanless again. That's another great source for repertoire. So the repertoire is quite vast. Um, keyboard harmony begins at grade four. Students have to harmonize a simple melody. And again, if you go to the video tutorials, you'll get a little bit more information about how we do this. It's actually quite easy when you break it down for students. I've taught it for years. I actually learned this way myself years ago when I was studying through the Western Ontario Conservatory of Music. Uh, it's a great way for students to understand chords, to become better readers, to become better improvisers. Their theory knowledge improves right at the keyboard. And so I'd encourage you to check those out using Deborah Wallace's books, but check out the tutorials first and you'll just see how easy it is. It's very similar to realizing lead sheets. Uh, here's an example of what students have to do at grade four. They have to be able to play this very simple chord progression. And we always give for keyboard harmony chord symbols at the top of the staff now. So basically we're playing one and five in, in a couple of different keys. And once they play that on an exam, they're given a little lead sheet like this where they have to play the chord in the left hand and sight read the right hand melody. Just simple harmonizing. By grade six, it changes and we have chords in the right hand, single notes in the left hand. That's a little more confusing. But after a couple of years of harmonizing in this manner, like a lead sheet style, it gets pretty easy for students. They're able to figure it out. So again, look at the tutorials. I've got one for grades four to five, one for grade six, and then seven, eight is a separate tutorial as well. And once you look at those, you'll, be, you'll have a really good start on how to do keyboard harmony with your students. Background information, I've talked about a little bit. These are some of the things that examiners ask when it comes to background information and students have to know about their repertoire. Any questions here about classical piano syllabus? That's kind of where I left off in my overview of that. Dawn, do you see anything? No, no questions here. So going to the contemporary idioms piano, Here's just an overview and I'll show you what the mark breakdown looks like. This is sort of an average of levels one to six. Always four pieces of repertoire. And if they memorize any two of those pieces, that makes up 50 marks or half of the assessment right there. The other half are for skills. Technique, technique includes scales, triads, chords, arpeggios, just like classical. Um, the neat thing about our technique on both of these streams, contemporary and classical, is easy to remember what keys are involved because starting at grade two, we have students do everything with one sharp and one flat. So it's G major, F major, and the relative minors, and that's it. In level three, it's two sharps and flats. In level four, it's three sharps and flats. The thing is by grade three and four on the contemporary side, we start throwing in a couple of modes that are related to those keys as well. Not a lot, we try to save the modes for the higher levels, the younger levels is more of a pop style, not so serious jazz. Uh, sight reading and ear training are pretty much identical to the classical piano now. And so that's easy to follow. I think you'll find that very familiar. It's improvisation and lead sheet reading that's a little bit different. In terms of repertoire, again, uh, four pieces varying in style as long as you have two different composers. One of the pieces may be classical. We have an updated contemporary list on our website every year. We update it with the latest and greatest. But even still, we're not going to get all the pop stylings up there. I've had students that are getting really good at playing hip hop on the piano, believe it or not, that you're not going to find on our syllabus anytime soon. But again, that's where the free approval process comes in. Students can edit the notation and the rhythm to make it level appropriate for themselves. They don't have to write in the edits, they just do them. We just want to hear the final result. We don't even need to hear the score or see the score for these. Memorize any two pieces. And again, the free approvals process is a great way to blow open our repertoire. Here's what lead sheet reading looks like for level four. A student for lead sheet reading just simply plays chord voicings in the left hand, three note chords, play the right hand as written. And that's the same from levels one to eight. 
And again, there's a couple of video tutorials that break that down. And I think we've had the suggestions on and I are going to follow up with a lead sheet reading webinar in January. I can see that. <laughs> so we'll talk a little bit about what that does. Here's what improv looks like. This comes from level two. And this comes from the Etudes book that I held up earlier. This is level one, but this is the one on the screen is from level two. And students see these little chord charts. And the beauty of the improv is that it relies on backing tracks that were created by Christopher Norton, all this music by Chris Norton, um, edited by Scott McBride Smith. And when I teach this, there are some good video tutorials on the website again on Contemporary Piano Plays where I break down how to teach this. But the essence of it is, is the examiner or the student plays the backing track for themselves on a speaker using whatever device they have, and they improvise hands together to that backing track. And it can be scripted. Um, but there are these modules in the Etudes book that show them different voice leadings, different rhythms they can use, different ideas in the right hand. I actually don't use the music anymore at all with any of my students for levels one, two, and three. I teach them all by rote, uh, especially as young students nowadays, they have such great ears. As soon as I show them the written music on the page, everything slows down and gets bogged down. I use it as a rote playing method and around grade, level four, level five, I start to show them the charts so that they understand how to improvise. It's wired into their brains a little better and they can use the chord chart to figure out how to count, but they don't actually play what's on the page. They don't have to play a single thing on the page as long as it sounds good at the backing track. And the, in, the tutorials I have will break it down for you and give you a little idea. It's very free and easy, but you'll develop your own style. And for myself, I started doing this about 12 years ago with students and really not knowing where to begin. It took me a while to figure out a system, but I realized how free it could just be. And, and you learn alongside a cohort of students right from level one up, you can gain a lot of confidence. So as, as, a, as a, you know, a classical pianist, I, I feel very much that at home improvising now after that length of time of just doing it with my students, even ma mainly from level one to six, not even at the higher levels. Dawn, do you have anything to add about the improv and what that was like working with students the first time? Um, yeah, so when I use these modules, I, I basically, I go through most, most often, the left hand is the same in all modules. I'm like, so um, as an examiner, we'll say, let's use this module. And I'm like, don't worry what they throw at you, right? The left hand's going to be the same. The only difference is maybe instead of them being half notes like you have shown there, maybe they're whole notes. All the notes are the same. So I, I always say, you know, if you want something to follow, just follow the left hand and then our right hand. Use that little block chord that, you know, um, the passage that Christopher Norton puts up there, our improv notes, and just have at her. You can, you can use it a, a guide, like you can use the rhythm as a guide, but the notes, I never have them learn any of that right hand. I'm very much the same. I said, you know, make up your own. And it's just freedom, right? And it gets them just exploring the keyboard, which I really, really like. You know, you know follow the left hand and just, yeah. Have that yeah. or right hand. <laughs> it can be kind of intimidating at first for teachers, but I find yeah, if you just give over to the process and learn alongside a cohort of students, watch the video tutorials, this can be a great thing. And I love it when students, you know, if they don't, if they haven't practiced for a couple of weeks and then come in, oh, it's been a busy week again. Well, guess what? We're going to have a backing track and we're going to have fun for half an hour with no music in front of us. You know, exactly. It's a great way to have fun and jam with them. Conservatory Canada Teachers Facebook page, a number of you are already members on that. Um, I've been approving a lot of you recently. I know it, like a, many every week now, all of a sudden there's an interest here, but this is where you can see about the webinars. We have a webinar every Friday. We're gonna take a little break from them now over the holiday, but we'll resume them again in January and try to have one every Friday on a different topic. We're also gonna introduce teacher groups, informal meetings of teachers. Dawn, do you wanna talk about the group that you're thinking of starting or that you work with? Yes, yeah, so right now I have a couple of teachers that uh, we meet every two weeks. So um, one of the teachers is in Calgary, one's in Ottawa. And every couple of weeks um, I have my private lessons with them. And then we get together and we just, we talk about anything that's, you know, as teachers, how would you show this, you know, to your students, you know, could be improvisation, could be, um, we, we talk from anything Conservatory Canada related, or it's just like, Okay, how do you deal with this parent? <laughs> you know, as teachers, we're all trying to find, you know, uh, ways of just, you know, bouncing ideas off of each other. And so what I like about it, it's just a nice little intimate group, right? So we're not going to have um, like 80 in a group. So maybe one week, you know, there'll be a group of five talking about this topic and another group of five. Oh, you know what? I'm interested in this. I want to join that little intimate group and talk about this. It could be where we talk about 
How do you show lead sheets? It could be anything. Um, so it's been really good. And it's kind of exciting because this little group that I've already started, we're actually working on an ensemble uh, together so that we're going to do and we're going to showcase it at each one of our recitals as teachers. So it's, it's just a nice little um, community that we can build in small little pods, right? So where you're not, you know, competing against 8,000 in a group where, you know, your comment all of a sudden gets blown by by 30 comments. And we meet right now we're meeting every couple of weeks. It could be once a month, but this is something that we're very excited and we're, you know, we can't wait till our next meeting. Yeah, that's nice. So we're going to start a bunch of these groups, all different themes. And so look for, look on the Conservatory Canada Teachers Facebook page. That's going to be the best place to find out how to get in these groups. We're also going to hit by email. If you're on our email list already, you probably are. Um, if you don't want to be just unsubscribe, but that's where you're going to hear about these, about, about all these events and little groups that we're going to start in the new year. Conservatory Canada radio podcast. We have four episodes there. You can find that on any podcast uh, app. And the latest one is with Deborah Wanless and Keyboard Harmony. We have a number of other uh, podcasts coming. Not as many podcasts lately, so kind of favoring more the webinar format, but the odd webinar that works out really well for audio in that format, I'm going to put on to the, the Conservatory Canada radio podcast as well. Here's the contact information for myself, uh, Don. Our registrar, Kelly Matthews, is at the office in London, Ontario. There's our 1-800 number next to her name. Uh, my private number there at the top of the page. You can text me if you have a question at some point in time. Usually that number doesn't get out there too much, but it's there today. And I'm happy to chat with you sometime on the phone. Email is probably the best way to reach out to us. However, if you have any questions, conservatorycanada.ca. Um, any questions or anything else anyone wanted to learn about, feel free to throw those in the Q&A chat box. If you raise your hand, I can unmute you and bring you on live right now so you can ask your question. You may have a question that, uh, that may be easier to answer without having to type it in. Please do that right now. As we wrap up here, I know we just past the top of the hour, so we do have a few minutes to answer more questions for anyone live, if anyone wants. I'm just going to wait a second. Do we see any questions in the chat box at all, Don? Uh, no, not right now. So, Derek, did we want to talk a little bit about um, our badges that we are will eventually be getting into? Yeah. Thanks for reminding me. That's a great idea. We're working on another stream. I mean, as if we don't have enough options already, but we realized that these certificate exams take a lot of work. The recital assessments take a lot of work for students. And there are a lot of students who work in these short bursts of curiosity throughout the year. And it's hard to harness them into a kind of goal, performance goal, assessment goal. We wanted something that was more inclusive that includes students, say, with disabilities. We see our fair share of these students in our in our studios these days because we can work one-on-one -on -one with them. And it's just nice to have a way to recognize and have a goal to work towards. So what we've developed is a system of earning digital badges where students will submit three pieces of repertoire at any level, and they pre-record those with their teacher or on their own whenever each piece is separately ready. And once a student registers for a particular badge level, they would upload those three pieces in the form of sending us three links. An examiner would go in, assess them, make some helpful comments, and then a digital badge gets issued with a gold, silver, or bronze standing. If a student doesn't like their standing, they could pay a small retest fee to retest and perhaps improve on that. It's a way to include other students in a way that doesn't have them do all of the work all at once, because we realize that maybe only 10% of our students can actually pull off an exam. What about the other 90% that wanna be a little bit more involved, but can't be? This is for them. And so watch for that in the new year. We're currently testing this out. We have to work out a few bugs in it, including our new database, which will be coming out in the next couple of months, hopefully. And then when we're ready, you'll see a big announcement of that, hopefully in the new year, before the end of this academic year, that we'll have this stream in place for people to use seeing some good ideas about the badge idea in the chat box there. Glad yeah. you liked it. It's something we've been thinking about for years and the pandemic has brought us the opportunity to work on it and hopefully we can deliver to this, deliver this to you soon. We just need to test it a little bit and it's pretty much ready to go. Kathy, I'm gonna allow you to talk. I see your hands raised. And if you have something, go ahead and talk. We'll be able to hear you. Can you hear me? Absolutely, go ahead. Okay. I'm just wondering, as an RCM person, if I were to switch students over to Conservatory Canada and let's say they had level six piano and level six theory, would level six theory be acceptable for your level six piano? Yeah, absolutely. So if they have level six theory, um, 
that's that's sort of intermediate rudiments that goes directly with our grade six. So if they wanted to, you're saying they already have level six theory done with RCM, but you want them to do a practical grade six exam with Conservatory Canada, is that right? Uh, yes, that could be a possibility. Or if they went on to level seven, would they just go into your level seven theory? Yeah, they would go into what, what our, for our grade seven, our theory is theory three at that point, which is advanced rudiments. They could also do, I know some people do this uh, and for whatever reason, they'll do the advanced theory with RCM or maybe they already have it done. And then you can apply to get a transfer credit so that when they do the grade seven practical with Conservatory Canada, their theory is covered that way as well. Just know that that's an option, um, but that's, that's exactly how it works. Okay, thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, Sabrina comments in the chat box, a bit teary about the idea that students who can't fit the exam mold can still feel that pride of accomplishment. It's exactly what that's about. Exactly what that's about. And, and, and we hope that this works for everybody in some way, shape or form. And it's great for um, students who may think that they're not able, you know, they're kind of sitting on the fence whether they want to do an exam. It gives them kind of like a, you know, a preliminary feel. They're like, you know what? I can do this exam, you know? So, and it, like you say, it's great for those that are busy and it's just, it's an exciting thing. I'm so stoked about this. Yeah, no, me too. It's, yeah, it's gonna be a great thing. Um, and then eventually it's gonna be more than just repertoire. Right now we're only rolling it out when we can get it out later this academic year for, for a repertoire for piano, but we have a, you know, an ensemble badge perhaps or a composition badge. Uh, maybe there'll be a technique badge. We're kind of shying away from the skills, but there'll be a chance for students to collect multiple badges at different levels, and then eventually for voice and guitar as well, and maybe even some of the other instruments in the long run. It's going to be a slow rollout for us, but uh, we hope that it'll be something that students can, teachers can use. Any other questions? Anyone, if you want to raise your hand again, anybody? Otherwise, I'm not seeing anything here. And we're well past the top of the hour. We don't like to keep people too long. Just thanks for your attention. There's still a lot of you on the call here, which is really great. Um, so in the absence of that, Don, any other final words or things that we've missed that we haven't talked about that I've, that I've missed here? Um, I think we've covered everything that we had hoped to. But if anybody has any questions about any of the programs, my, my email's there. You know, shoot me. This is what I do. Mm -hmm. Send me an email. I'd be more than happy to work with you on anything. Yeah, and, and, and either of us are free to get on the phone as well. I, 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 I talk with a few teachers every week, it seems, about one thing or another, a little bit of, you know, talking about pedagogy, how do I get this? Do I have this right? How can I do that with this student? You know, we're open that. We're small enough we can do that with you. Uh, Stacy's asking, can you skip exam grade levels? Absolutely. Students can jump in anywhere they want. Yeah, uh, we have, you know, I know there's a couple of teachers we have out west that just, they do the associate diploma with their students and that's it. They cover all the theory seven that goes with it at the same time. Okay, so thanks everyone. I think that wraps us up here for today. Don't see any other questions. Reach out to us anytime. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for your feedback and comments in the chat box. I wanna thank Dawn for joining us here today. So early for thank seeing you. Thank you for having me. It's been really great. So take care everyone and uh, watch for the next webinar early in the new year, probably the second Friday in January. We'll have something ready for you. <laughs>